you're probably thinking, hang on, you've already made a video on Cartimandua. Are you so devoid of original ideas that you've taken to rehashing old topics? Well, first of all, I've got a lot of exciting videos coming up, but yes, I did make a video on Cartimandua a year ago, and it's quite good. But whilst that one is quite factual, this one is more of a, to use a currently popular parlance, hot take. You see, recently I've become interested in historiography, how we viewed Cartimandua in history, especially in relation to that other famous Celtic queen, Boudicca. I don't know where else to put this, so what did one Celt say to the other? Hit the woad, Jack. <laughs> The thing with Boudicca is that she's won the popular vote. She's there in statues, art, even Elizabeth I's famous I have the body of a woman speech at Tilbury Fort in 1588 has echoes of Boudicca's speech before her final battle. And like many of you, she was the only Celtic figure I was taught about in school. I have vivid memories of someone visiting school dressed up as her and on a trip to London I remember photographing the majestic statue with her arms raised in triumph. So whilst Boudicca has been woven into the very fabric of British culture and identity, I mean she's clearly there in the anthropomorphic depiction of Britain itself, Britannia, Cartimandua has often been cast as a villain. So why was Boudicca embraced and Cartimandua spurned? Well let's find out. But before I dive into this, there's something I want to mention first. There's quite a tendency in both history and current society to set up women against each other. You can see it most clearly in the way that the media will set up a rivalry between two female pop singers, as though two successful female musicians cannot coexist without rivalry. And in the same way, there is a trend in history of pitting two female historical figures against each other, as though they cannot both share a pedestal and so I don't want to play into this I think it's rather divisive and unhelpful so I'm not trying to take down Boudicca I'm merely trying to understand why she became popular and Cartimandua didn't. So the first and immediately obvious reason why Boudicca became popular was because she fought against the Romans whereas Cartimandua allied with them. There's this glamorous idea of fighting to defend your people, and it's certainly admirable, but I think automatically assuming that anyone who allied with the Romans was a disloyal quizzling is a little unfair when you look at the context of the time. For a start, the Celtic tribes were fighting each other anyway. There was no sense of shared unity or identity as there are in modern countries today. So when the greatest military machine and empire that the world had seen to that point came knocking, it was a pretty strategically advantageous position to ally with them. Katamandra was just doing what was necessary to protect her people, which is what Boudicca did, but in a different way. This also feeds into another important aspect in the creation of British identity, which is resistance. From Alfred the Great and Caractacus to Herod the Wake, we have selected certain individuals from history who resisted invaders as being culturally significant. So naturally, Boudicca fell right into this category, whereas Cartimandua, who allied with the invaders, sticks out like a sore thumb. She was probably viewed as being somewhat disloyal to Britain, which, as silly as it sounds to us today, because we know that Britain as a concept didn't exist back then, nor any modern European country, it probably made some subconscious impact. So Boudicca, because of her rebellion, was embraced by historians as embodying a certain Britishness, Rather like how Arminius, who famously led the Germanic tribes into victory over the Romans at the Battle of Tautoburg, was embraced in the 19th century as representing parts of German identity. Interestingly, both figures had statues of them built which cemented their place in national identity. So, when Germany beat France in the Franco-Prussian War of 1871, a statue of Arminius was built to represent German victory. And in the same way, when Queen Victoria hosted the Great Exhibition in 1851, which cemented Britain's place as the most powerful empire in the world, that famous statue of Boudicca was commissioned, the ultimate symbol of powerful British women. 
The thing for which Catamandua was most infamous, however, was for the capture of Caractacus. He was a leader of the Catuvillani tribe and for many years had led a guerrilla campaign against the Romans before being defeated and fleeing to the Brigantes. And yes, it was a court of King Caractacus who was just passing by. Now, Catamandua captured him and handed him over to the Romans and he famously won his freedom by giving a brilliant speech to Emperor Claudius. This is a defining event for which she has been unfairly cast as a villainess, with some going so far as to say that she betrayed him. But this is baffling. For a start, as I said, there was no unity among the Celts, so how could she betray someone who was just viewed as a member of a different tribe? In addition, she was simply fulfilling an obligation to her ally. What other choice did she have? Harbour an enemy of her allies and possibly risk their wrath? In addition, Caractacus himself fought against neighbouring tribes. His conquest of the Atribates tribe, for example, conveniently does not get a mention in narratives of him being a great British Celt who resisted the Romans, because it is rather awkward if you then go on to kill other British Celts. Oh, and by the way, the leader of the Atribates also went to the Romans for help, so it wasn't an unusual thing. Catamandra was rewarded handsomely for handing over Caractacus to the Romans, and so this probably affected people's perception of her because it reminded them of Judas betraying Jesus for money. A final reason why Catamandra was cast as a villain is because of her personal relationships. She was divorced from her husband and later took up with his chariot driver, which was quite scandalous. And also in contrast to Boudicca, who did not have any particularly salacious relationships that we know of. And so whilst Boudicca was seen as pure by the, and we've got to say it, predominantly male historians, because she conformed to normative ideas about female relationships, Cartimandua embodied a certain sexuality which probably made a lot of people uncomfortable. It's likely that she fed into the wicked temptress trope which is so common in art and literature. So basically the answer to the question I set at the beginning of this video is that we construct certain historical narratives and often fail to understand the context of the time. Boudicca was chosen as a great British heroine partly because people didn't understand the context of the past and also projected their own ideas onto first century Britain, thereby misconstruing Cartimandua's actions as wicked or underhand and casting her as the villain. Boudicca has become seen as this almost William Wallace figure, woven into the fabric of British history, culture and identity, whereas Cartimandua remains either a footnote or a villain. That's all I've got time for today. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've learnt something new and I hope to see you again soon.